Turned Up Dead is a true crime podcast. The cases we cover include details of violence, sexual assault, suicide, and homicide. It is not suitable for children, and listener discretion is advised. The opinions expressed in this show are those of individuals and not Turned Up Dead. Hello, and welcome to Turned Up Dead. I'm Fiona, and the true crime story I'm going to tell you today is of the murder of Lin Shenhong. This case is a little different from those I've covered in previous episodes. Lin's case is unsolved, and quite little is known about her death. But despite that, or rather because of that, I feel it's important for her story to be told. Around 9.45pm, on Sunday June 9th, 1991, a cleaner entered an upstairs room of Pinky's Massage Parlour in Borton, Chester. Inside, lying in a pool of blood, was the semi-naked body of a woman in her late twenties. She had been stabbed multiple times on the upper half of her body. Pinkies, like many similar massage parlour businesses in towns and cities across the UK, was a working brothel. When police got to the scene, they found a note which listed four men who had made bookings to see a woman named Blondie that day. Appointments had been booked for Mike at 12.50pm, Paul at 12.55pm, Andy at 2.20pm, and John at 5pm. The deceased woman, presumably Blondie, had been working alone at the massage parlour and was the only member of staff on the premises until the cleaner had arrived and discovered her body. She was soon identified as 29-year-old Lynn Trenholm from Failsworth a suburb on the outskirts of Manchester. Her home was about an hour's drive from Pinkies, where she had worked for two years. Whilst working at Pinkies, Lynn had used the names Marilyn and Blondie. Understandably, given the opinions many people have about sex work and sex workers, especially in the early 90s, Lynn had told her family and friends that she worked as a clerk in Manchester so they were shocked when they discovered that she had really been working at Pinkies. In many murder cases in which the killer isn't known, the families and friends of the victim are often the first source of information for police. But in this case, because Lynn Trenholm's family and friends didn't know Lynn worked at Pinkies, they were unlikely to have been able to give him police much, if anything, that would lead them to her killer. Other women who worked at Pinkies would have known a lot more about Lynn's working life. When police got to the scene, they didn't find the murder weapon, but they did find what at first seemed to be a promising clue, a bloody fingerprint. There was a chance that the name of Lynn's killer was on the appointment list. If police could match the fingerprint to one of the men on that list, it would surely be an open and shut case. However, Pinky's was a working brothel, so anyone could have walked in without making an appointment. Furniture was taken to be examined, and the police set about finding and identifying the four men who had appointments with Lynn on the day she was murdered. The next day, Monday 10th of June 1991, the Liverpool Echo ran a front-page story about the murder, under the headline, Blondie's Sauna Killer Hunted. Lynn's story shared the front page with the story of another murder police were looking to solve. Above both stories, it reads, quote, Two murdered, and attack victim fights for life after horror weekend. Beneath the photograph of Lynn, the article gave an overview of what had happened, gave some insight into where police were at in their investigation, and appealed to the public for help. Throughout the article, Pinkies was called a massage parlour and sauna, and Lynn was referred to as a masseuse, although I'm sure most readers would have easily understood that Pinkies was a brothel. The leading detective, Detective Superintendent Will Brown, told the paper, quote, I cannot say at this stage whether the victim had been sexually assaulted, end quote. But he did reveal, quote, it was not a particularly frenzied attack, end quote. The murder weapon still hadn't been found, and police believed it to be a long blade. The last time Lynn was seen alive was at 1.30pm and police were investigating a phone conversation she was thought to have at 4.50pm. The police were reported to be anxious to speak to two men who had been seen leaving Pinkies at around 5.30pm on the day Lynn was murdered, 
The detective superintendent said, quote, We wish to trace the men so that they can be eliminated from our inquiries. End quote. Police were also trying to contact other women who had worked at Pinkies since it opened in the late 1980s, and a hotline had been set up for people to report tips and information. The next day, Lynn's story had moved to page four. In an article headlined, Stolen Cash Clue in Hunt for Lynn's Murderer, it was revealed that the police thought the motive to have been robbery. D.S. Will Brown told the Echo that a substantial amount of cash had been taken. Police now wanted to speak to three men who D.S. Brown named as Mike, Andy and John. He told the public that they were at Pinkies on Sunday, but he didn't go as far as saying that they were three of the four men on Lynn's appointment list. I couldn't find out, but I think it's fair to presume that the fourth man who had an appointment on the day of the murder, Paul, had already contacted police. As his appointment was at 12.55pm, I think it's likely that he was the last person to see Lynn alive at 1.30pm. Through the paper, D.S. Brown had a message for the three men. Quote, I want each of them to get in touch. It will save a lot of time and possible embarrassment. End quote. The killer could have been a client who had decided to commit the robbery when he realised he and Lynn were alone in the building. Or just as easily, the money might have had nothing to do with Lynn's murder and could have been taken to make it seem like a robbery gone wrong. What might have worried police more was that the killer could have been someone who hadn't visited Pinky's before and who went there with the sole purpose of stealing the money. The day Lynn was killed was a Sunday. The night before being a Saturday would have probably been one of the busiest nights of the week. And since banks in the UK are closed on Sundays, no banking would have been done since Saturday night, so those takings would likely still be on the premises. To a thief, that could be quite tempting, especially if they knew that there was only one woman working there alone. On Wednesday 12th of June, police launched another hotline. This telephone line would bypass the police switchboard and go directly to a detective and therefore offer more privacy for Mike, Andy and John, who still hadn't come forward. If police were hoping to receive a call from the murderer, he might have been put off calling by the headline the Liverpool Echo chose to report on it that day. Hotline bid to trap Blondie's killer. I couldn't help noticing the placement of this report, right next to a story about Julia Roberts, who had become a household name by playing a sex worker in Pretty Woman, which had been released just the previous summer. Perhaps Andy, Lynn's 2.20pm client, responded to the police's plea and used the new hotline, because on Thursday, June 13th, the police were only asking for Mike and John to come forward. The headline of the Liverpool Echo story on this day was New Plea to Men on Sauna Murder. The opening sentence reads, quote, Police hunting the killer of masseuse, Lynn Trenholm, have drawn a blank in their search for two men who could help in the investigation. End quote. Promising confidence, police urged Mike and John to come forward and promised that their wishes would be respected. But by the end of the week, police still hadn't heard from the two men. On Friday, June 14th, they renewed their appeal for witnesses. The Echo reported that the police had interviewed hundreds of people, but were yet to make any major breakthrough in the hunt for the killer. Reporters had spoken with Lynn's mother, Jo, who commented that Lynn had been leading a double life. On Monday 17th of June, Police divers started to search nearby waterways, the River Dee and the Shropshire Union Canal, in hope of finding the murder weapon. A police spokeswoman said that police had been appealing for the two men to come forward and gave a description of Mike as aged around 40, 5 foot 8 inches tall, slim, with mousy coloured wavy hair, clean shaven and wearing jeans and a jumper. The Echo reported that the police believed a painter and decorator from Anglesey might have clues. Anglesey is an island accessed by a suspension bridge just off the northwest coast of Wales. The Echo said police had, quote, widened their net to North Wales, end quote. I found no other mention of their investigations into this, and there were no more updates on Lynn's case by the end of the second week of investigation. On Saturday 22nd of June, the Liverpool Echo printed a brief update under the headline 
time up in Blondie Killer Hunt. Police apparently had the names and addresses of several men who had visited Pinkies and were giving them an ultimatum. Come forward to police by the following night, or police would approach them. There was also a quote from the police spokeswoman repeating that coming forward would avoid possible embarrassment. The following week turned up a new clue. However, the Liverpool Echo's report of this on Tuesday 25th of June 1991 had shrunk to 40 words in a side column. In full, it read, quote, A green wax jacket may have been worn by the murderer who stabbed Chester Masseuse Lynn Trenholm, 29, at Pinky Sauna in Borton, say police. Police have appealed for anyone who finds such a blood-stained jacket to contact them. End quote. In the text, the word bean is repeated, and masseuse is spelled M-A-S-S-S-U-E-S-E. By Friday 28th of June, 1991, police had new information about the man who had the 5pm appointment with Lynn. The Liverpool Echo reported that police were trying to trace a, quote, good-looking client who may hold vital clues, end quote. The man only known as John was described as being, quote, in his late twenties, six foot two inches, slim and muscular, clean shaven and lightly tanned with fair hair, end quote. This man had visited two massage parlours within an hour of Pinkies in the towns of Warrington and Crewe, and during these visits he had threatened staff. Detectives working on the case hoped that the description of this man would lead them to a breakthrough. This article also reported that a number of people connected to the massage parlour business were offering a substantial reward for information that led to Lynn's killer being caught, and a photo fit was created and circulated. Staff at a massage parlour in Manchester called police when a man came in who resembled the photo fit. Police arrived, arrested the semi-naked man, and took him in for questioning. His home, which happened to be in the same town as Lynn's, was searched. However, as reported by the Liverpool Echo on Tuesday 4th of July 1991, the 36-year-old man was questioned for 24 hours and then released. Five weeks after Lynn was killed, a newly refurbished Pinkies reopened with new staff and the papers were left with nothing to report on. On the 9th of August, there was a brief article in the Echo which gave a brief overview of the murder and reminded readers that Lynn's killer was still at large. Interestingly, it noted that police said the motive was burglary, but the police had refused to say what had been taken. The next article wasn't until August 19th, when it was reported that a large knife, which matched the weapon thought to have been used to kill Lynn, was missing from her home. It was thought that Lynn might have carried the knife for self-protection. There was then no mention of Lynn Trenholm or the search for her killer until January 1992, when the possibility of her case being hindered was mentioned in an article about a planned 25% cut to Cheshire Police's overtime budget. The Liverpool Echo printed a one-sentence update on 19th of February 1992, which said, quote, Police have pledged that the hunt for the killer of Cheshire Masseuse, Lynn Trenholm, 29, found murdered at Pinkies in Borton, Chester, on 9th of June last year, would continue, despite announcing that an inquest is to be held on March 17th. End quote. In the UK, an inquest is held when someone dies from violence or in an unnatural matter, if they die in police custody or in prison, or if the cause of death is unknown. They're separate from a criminal trial and aim to answer how someone died, not who was responsible. In November 1991, Lynn's case was featured on Crime Watch in an attempt to get any new information from the public. A description of John, which they mentioned might not be his real name, was given, and the photo fit was shown. The show also asked viewers for tips about a car that had been seen parked outside of Pinkies at 4.50pm on the day of the murder. The car was a dark blue metallic Vauxhall Carlton. Unfortunately, the segment on Crime Watch didn't turn up anything that led to Lynn's killer, and her case went cold. 
Around the 10th anniversary of her death in June 2001, North Wales Live reported that detectives hoped that advances in DNA testing could help police solve Lynn's case. Detective Chief Inspector John Armstrong made an appeal for anyone with any information to come forward, saying, quote, You may have known someone who you believe may have had an involvement in this murder and has escaped justice for a decade. End quote. In the previous 10 years, over 700 people were questioned by police investigating Lynn's murder. Lynn's case was also examined as part of a nationwide investigation codenamed Enigma. The Enigma investigation involved 26 police forces from across the UK and was set up to uncover any links between unsolved murders of 207 women. 72 of these cases were said to need further analysis, but Lynn's case appears not to have been one of them, as in 2001 North Wales Live reported that there has never been anything to link Lynn's murder to any other. On the 21st anniversary of Lynn's death in 2012, police launched a renewed appeal to the public for information. Lynn's mother, Joan, also appealed for help in finding her daughter's killer. She told the Manchester Evening News, quote, She was my daughter, and it didn't matter what she did for a living at Pinkies. End quote. Detective Chief Inspector Simon Price told the Chester Standard that Lynn's case had been reviewed the previous year and that Cheshire police remain committed to finding the person responsible. Despite the renewed appeal prompting 18 people to call in with tips in its first weekend, no arrests were made. Tragically, this is still where Lynn's case is at today. On May 10th, 2020, Cheshire Live published an article with the headline The 29-Year-Old Mystery of One of Chester's Most Baffling Unsolved Murders. It gave an overview of Lynn's murder and finished by saying, quote, Despite numerous appeals and reviews over the past 29 years, including on BBC's Crime Watch UK, nobody has ever been charged in connection with Lynn's murder. End quote. Despite furniture taken from the scene being re examined following advances in DNA testing and the fingerprint being checked against those in the national database over the years, as of the time of recording, in August 2021, Lynn Trenholm's murder is still unsolved. Lynn was 29 years old when she was killed. If the man, who still may be walking free today, hadn't cut her life so short, Lynn would be 59 today. Lynn Trenholm lived in Failsworth, Greater Manchester. Before she worked at Pinkies, she was a nursing home assistant. In 1991, Lynn was in a new relationship and she had told her mother that she was going to ask a man to marry her. Her mother, Joan, described Lynn as warm and affectionate, and bubbly, cheeky, and dynamic. As usual, I'm going to share a few thoughts on this case. Please bear in mind that these are my personal opinions based on what I've been able to find out, and that I have no background in law enforcement or law. That being said, The questions I'd like to discuss are whether the police did enough to find Lynn's killer, whether her case can still be solved, and the legal approaches to prostitution people are campaigning for the UK to take. I think it's impossible to say if police did enough to investigate, given the little we know. Lynn's story wasn't widely reported in the media, but even if it had been a bigger story, I doubt we'd know too much more about the police's investigation, as the case is still unsolved. Eight sex workers were killed in the UK in 1991. Of these eight, which were all women, one was killed by her husband. Two men were charged with the murder of another, but were then freed due to lack of evidence. One man was acquitted of the murder of a third woman, and the remaining five women's murders, which include Lynn Trenholm, remain unsolved. It's well known that police did little to investigate to be able to connect the murders of sex workers by Peter Sutcliffe in the 1970s. And I would hope that 20 years after that, when Lynn was killed, police would be more proactive when it came to violence against sex workers. In 1991, I was too young to watch Pretty Woman with its softened version of sex work and happily ever after ending, let alone have any awareness of the realities of sex work at the time. 
So I tried to find something that would give some insight into sex workers and their interactions with police in the UK in the 90s. I found a documentary that was made by BBC Two in 1998 titled Julie's Story, which focuses on the unsolved murder of sex worker Julie Jones in 1996. The documentary features interviews with Julie Jones's family, Manchester police and with sex workers who worked the streets of Manchester alongside Julie. It explores whether claims by sex workers in Manchester that the murder of one of their own got a second-class official response as society sees them as second-class citizens. A sex worker named Anne told the film workers that she didn't think police were really bothered about Julie's death and that it would be entirely different if she had done any other work, in which case she believed there would have been public outcry. It's easy to understand why she believes this, by the account she gave of one of her interactions with police. She said, quote, Well, as far as they're concerned, and they actually turn around and say it to you, that if you're on the street, you're there, you're asking for everything you get. You know what's happening. If you don't want to put yourself at risk, stay at home. End quote. An officer in Manchester's vice squad said that, quote, nothing could be further from the truth, end quote. A detective superintendent said police put the same amount of effort into every murder, whether it be a prostitute or anyone else. But later in the documentary, he did admit that Manchester police had uncovered a large number of previously unreported violence towards sex workers since investigating the murder of Julie Jones. And I think another comment from the member of the vice squad reveals some victim blaming. Speaking of street-based sex workers, he said, quote, one might argue they have a choice not to enter that world. And I know to a certain extent that isn't directly our job. Our job is to ensure the streets are safe. But equally, there is a choice element here to a certain extent. Sometimes girls, when they're offered that particular choice, don't take it. End quote. In 2001, 10 years after Lynn was murdered, Police were criticised for not calling an amnesty on sex workers and their clients after the murder of Rebecca Hall, which resulted in witnesses not approaching police. Numerous police forces from across the UK have faced criticism regarding the handling of crimes against sex workers. The Independent in October 2011 reported that experts claim that the public, media and police only become interested when there's a sensational element to the murders of sex workers such as a serial killer, and their individual deaths, quote, often fail to capture public attention or sympathy, reflecting the negative attitudes many people still hold towards women who sell sex for a living, end quote. One of my initial thoughts while reading the news articles from 1991 following Lynn's murder was that the police seemed to be asking a lot by asking the men who had been at Pinkies on the day of the murder to come to them. Though on reflection, I think I was a bit quick to judge. Solving a murder with no witnesses, which took place in a brothel in the early 1990s, is no easy task. The crime scene is in a place used by many people, which would make forensic investigation a nightmare. It's in a cash-based business that keeps no record of its customers, and where pseudonyms are commonly used. The man who never came forward was only known as John, the well-known slang term for a sex worker's client. And of course, with it being the early 90s, CCTV was few and far between. I think police needed the men to come forward, because they had no way of finding them without the public's help. Something I first found myself angered by was the police's emphasis of saving the men who had been at Pinkies the day of the murder from embarrassment, especially as the men came forward and police were appealing for John to come forward. Though after more thought, the police might have been doing their best to get more information when they had little else to go on. Also, two men had been seen leaving Pinkies on the afternoon Lynn was killed, and if one of these men was the murderer, the man with him might have been more likely to contact police if they were taking a seemingly softer approach. Given the circumstances, I think it's more than likely that the client known as John did kill Lynn Chanhoe. This is presuming that her boyfriend at the time was thoroughly looked at and ruled out. This man, John, would now be over the age of 50. 
I found no newspaper reports of the murder from 1991 in any nationwide newspapers, and I only found one article in the British National Archives that wasn't from the locally circulated Liverpool Echo. A single short article in the Aberdeen Evening Express. So there may well be people out there with important information who didn't hear of Lynn's murder and missed the police's appeals. Because of this, and because of the fingerprint, I do think Lynn's case can be solved. I found no mention of accent, which makes me think that the John character was local. He was known to have been violent towards staff at other massage parlours in the area, and I would think that a non-local accent would have been noticed by the staff who gave this information to police. This man might still be living in the area. He could be a neighbour, a familiar face at the local pub, or even someone you know. While researching Lynn's case, there was an error in the online search of past newspapers, and an article unrelated to Lynn's case was included in my results. Coincidentally, this article was in the local paper of where I grew up, and the name of the small village I lived in caught my eye as did the name of the street that my childhood best friend lived on. I was then shocked to read that a man that lived on her street had been imprisoned for setting fire to his own home with his family inside, killing three of his four children. He was dragged out of the house, and his wife and baby were able to escape. I grew up in that village, and like most small communities, people like to talk, yet I had never heard of this. So if you are in the Manchester to Liverpool area or have friends or family who are, please mention Lynn's case. They might know something that can help find her killer. There is also the chance that this John is no longer in the area, but don't let that put you off if you think you might have some information. Many people leave an area after committing a crime. He might have travelled to Chester from somewhere else, and it happened 30 years ago, which leaves plenty of time for him to have relocated. If you have any information that could help police, you can report it by calling 101 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. 30 years is a long time to keep something to yourself. Someone else might know what happened and may have let something slip over the years. Not many details were given by police. We don't know where and the number of times Lynn was stabbed and what, if anything else, was taken. We do know that money was taken, so anyone who suddenly had a large amount of cash around June 91 would be of interest to police. The knife, believed to be a 10-inch butcher's knife from Lynn's kitchen, wasn't found. Who knows, that could be wrapped up or in a tin in someone's attic. The green wax jacket was only mentioned once, but also doesn't appear to have been found. And the car mentioned on Crime Watch could be another clue. It was a metallic dark green Vauxhall Carlton. I've put a photo of the same model car on my website and there's a link to that in the show description. Police believe that many of Pinky's customers didn't make themselves known. Even if they were nowhere near Pinky's and are completely innocent of Lynn's murder, they might have information that is still valuable. These men would be 50 and older today. There are probably women who worked at Pinky's who haven't spoken to police either and they might also hold vital information. Women who worked in Pinkies would be in their late 40s and older. If you have any information that could help police, you can report it by calling 101 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. The police have the fingerprint, and more recent testing of other evidence might have even given them a DNA profile. Even if the man who murdered Lynn Trenholm is dead, her case still needs to be solved. Between 1990 and 2016, 180 sex workers were murdered, and 110 of these murders were directly sex work related. This number only accounts for those who were found, and I think it's likely that some missing sex workers are undiscovered murder victims. I believe UK laws regarding prostitution have contributed to the public's and the police's unsympathetic attitude towards sex workers in the past and that the UK's current laws may well be doing more harm than good. Just to note, when I use the words prostitute and prostitution, it's in reference to the UK laws which use this terminology. So what are the laws on prostitution in the UK? 
The buying and selling of sexual services, including sex, isn't illegal in the UK. But there are many laws concerning it which make related activities illegal. Some of these illegal activities are buying and selling sex in public, controlling prostitution, managing a brothel, and activities linked to exploitation. All laws are gender neutral. The laws surrounding prostitution aim to protect people forced into prostitution and target those making a living from the earnings of prostitutes. But those who want to see these laws abolished say they are putting sex workers at risk. The English Collective of Prostitutes are campaigning for the decriminalisation of all prostitute-specific laws. Laws on trafficking are separate and the English Collective of Prostitutes are not asking for the removal of these. In 2009, a new Policing and Crime Act came into effect and was quickly criticised for making sex work more dangerous. Some parts of it are good. It gave police the power to raid any premises where they suspected sex workers were being controlled for gain. I think everyone will agree that that's a good thing. The problem was, was that the Act also gave police power to raid and close any place they suspect to be a brothel, and UK law sees a brothel as any place where two or more prostitutes work together. So the Act applies to two adult sex workers who have entered prostitution willingly and work together for safety. The English Collective of Prostitutes say this makes sex workers have to choose between breaking the law and risking their own safety. A statistic on their website says that 74% of off-street sex workers are mothers who need to provide for their children. In 2020, a sex worker named Emily told Sky News that the law puts women like her in danger on a daily basis and asked, quote, how can we keep ourselves safe when we're on our own? End quote. Emily is a single mother who could face at least seven years in prison if caught working in her own apartment with another sex worker. Cisgendered women like Emily do make up the majority of sex workers, but there are many transgender women and male sex workers whose lives are also affected by these laws. In 1991, two of the murdered sex workers were men, and three were transgendered women. Some of those who oppose decriminalising prostitution-specific laws want new laws to make the purchasing of sexual services illegal. This is the model in some European countries, Canada and Northern Ireland, and it's known as the Nordic model, due to it being first introduced in Sweden in 1999. It's also known as the Sex Buyer Law. Cease.org.uk is one organisation that campaigns for the introduction of this approach in the UK. Cease, the centre to end all sexual exploitation, view prostitution as a global human rights violation. Their website states, quote, We maintain the position that the Swedish approach of criminalising those who purchase sexual access whilst decriminalising those within prostitution, we maintain the position that the Swedish approach of criminalising those who purchase sexual services whilst decriminalising those within prostitution is the most effective way of combating the grave human rights abuse that is the system of prostitution, end quote. When I first heard of this approach, I agreed with it, but I've since changed my mind. It groups all sex workers as victims who need rescuing from prostitution, and no matter what your moral view on buying sex, this just isn't the case. Obviously, people being controlled by others and being forced into providing sexual services is bad, but they're not sex workers. They're slavery and rape victims. I haven't mentioned sex workers addicted to drugs. My opinion there is that they need medical help for their addictions and shouldn't be treated as criminals for prostitution. The English Collective of Prostitutes say they are campaigning to decriminalise sex work to make all women safe. In some parts of the world, many workers, and mostly women, and even children, are exploited and have little or no choice other than work in dangerous circumstances in garment factories. But our reaction to this isn't to make garment factories illegal, or to stop people buying clothes altogether. We easily understand that not all garment factory workers are in that situation, and that people will always want clothes. This clothes example is a little silly, but that's really what governments around the world have been trying to do with sex work for a long time. And they've been failing. 
I think we should listen to sex workers and get over the fact that some people will always want to pay for sexual services and others are willing to provide them. And I'm not alone in thinking this. A 2019 study revealed that the majority of the British public supported sex work law reform and MPs have also called for changes to the law. You can learn more about the arguments for decriminalising prostitution-related laws by using hashtag MakeAllWomenSafe. And if you would like to support the English Collective of Prostitutes in their campaign, you can sign their petition. I've put a link in the show description. During research, I learned of a possibly life-saving app and website named Ugly Mugs. That's U-G-L-Y-M-U-G-S. It's a way for sex workers to inform each other about clients who have been violent or have mistreated sex workers in some other way. If you are a sex worker, please check it out. And if you know anyone who is, please tell them about it. I wasn't able to find the same thing in the US, but I did find a website named Verify Him, which is used by some sex workers. And finally, if you have any information that could help identify Lin Chenhong's killer, no matter how small or insignificant you think it is, please report it by calling 101 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening to Turned Up Dead. All sources can be found at turnedupdead.com at turnedupdead.com and there's a link directly to them in the episode description. Remember, if you listen carefully, even the words of liars will tell you the truth.